first one to show a little video. So, uh, academic and it's theater and it's the place where they both meet. We have the audience and participants for each other. Intellectual practice is a start of practice is cultural practice. Examples of women sharing what it is that you do, sharing how you do that. There's no way you can ignore Latinos anymore. Welcome from all around the world, you can come and see the talk about What time is it now uh, in Kenya? <laughs> So, first of all, welcome everybody to the Martin e. Siegel Theatre Center here at the Graduate Center CUNY, and thank you for watching a bit of our propaganda. Uh, <laughs> before we, we go over to Andre, we steal a little bit of um, the light uh, that comes um, from him as, a, uh, as the old uh, sailors on the ships when they navigated the ocean, they looked up to the stars where to go, and they were somewhere brighter and less, but you knew how to navigate the oceans and the oceans of life of theatre and Andre with his work for sure, is uh, one, of the, one of the stars. We all uh, orient uh, our little uh, ships. Uh, uh, and so, Andres, thank you so much, first of all, for coming and joining us here at the Siegel Center. Thank you for inviting me. He uh, spent six hours, I said that earlier today when we showed the film, six or seven hours in a plane yesterday in Berlin, and then the plane did not leave. They did not leave them out, so he had to go back, uh, spend a night in a hotel, come back to the airport and just arrived, I think, three or four hours ago at uh, Newark Airport. And uh, so it is a quite, a, quite, a, quite an accomplishment. And um, Andre um, just celebrated his 90th birthday in Berlin a couple of weeks ago. So I'm Frank Hinchka, I'm from the Siegel Theatre Center here, the director. We do bridge academia and professional theater, uh, international and American theater. We do focus on theater and performance. And, uh, um, and my work here also would not have been thinkable uh, if I hadn't been uh, one of the students of Angebot at that, what we heard in the afternoon, now legendary Gießen Theater Institute. So um, it's kind of a, a circle, as we said here in a circle of our homecoming. Part of the video we showed also was filmed here in this space. So Pavel did a great job, I think, to um, combine some threads. Uh, and um, so um, when I heard that Angie would be coming, visiting uh, uh, New York and uh, South Carolina, I said, we really have to uh, get him here, invite him here, uh, him speak, his, his thoughts. And, uh, and I said, there will be an audience. So really, thank you so much for, for coming and joining. And I see many friends and, uh, and compatriots or comrades uh, in arms uh, from uh, over, you know, uh, six, seven decades where Andrzej Wirt uh, has followed theater. He's one who has seen the Mother Courage uh, directed by Brecht in Warsaw, who has seen the openings of uh, Kortowski, of uh, Tadeusz Kantor, of Mrozek, someone who has translated Brecht and Frisch and Dürrenmatt, someone who went as a little kid in a tram uh, through the Warsaw ghetto, who was part of an underground school, had to leave it, saw the horrors of the Warsaw uprising, or knew about it with his father, who was a minister, Polish minister in exile in London, and then um, went on and, um, and saw the American avant-garde very early on, Richard Foreman, Robert Wilson, Meredith Monk, and, and so many, many others, but especially the work of, of Robert Wilson, and he uh, then created that school, the Gießen School of Angewandte Theaterwissenschaft, Applied Studies, that really um, 
was even uh, some said it was the 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 uh, the end of the German theater. It was written in the German FAZ magazine. They, there was such a um, a military institution designed to end German theater, as some critics wrote. And great people came out. I saw in the program Remini Protocol. He, she, Pop, God Squad, Hans Werner Krösinger, Helena Waldmann, um, an endless number of Rene Polish very early on. So this is all uh, the Gießen school and the Gießen influence that uh, Andre has put together. So it's a really a, a, a great, great honor to have him back here. Also, Andre, next to all his teachings at Stanford and, and Harvard or Yale, also taught at CUNY and uh, was a, a professor um, at, uh, I think, at Lehman and uh, City College. And I think Bonnie Maranka, who was, uh, was a student. Who else? Uh, I saw Eleanor Fuchs, but she no, couldn't make it, I think, tonight. So he also has uh, formed um, uh, 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 generation, Jonathan Kalb, I think, went to see him when he was in Berlin and did Johanna Müller studies, who's also a teacher here at CUNY. So it's really, um, uh, uh, he spent uh, uh, decades in continents. So Andre, um, the evening tonight will be uh, a, 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 an open conversation about theater. And first of all, how does it feel to be back uh, in New York City? Well, uh, the question comes to Andy. <laughs> I actually uh, was not prepared to. I, I was actually ready to uh, to come yesterday, as he had said. Yes, so uh, confusion and uh, being very tired, of course. And, uh, uh, it was not pleasant what happened before, but. Just to be in Manhattan made me again happy, yes. And the idea for this trip is actually that I will go to the south where I was once there, actually ready for for happy retirement. And it happened before the call from Germany. Uh, I'm talking about Uh, about the early 80s. Is it louder now? Maybe a bit louder? About 80s. I, I thought that my academic career is uh, actually close. And then uh, came this call from Germany, and uh, a country which is very uh, bureaucratically uh, ruled. And uh, it was an age problem um, that they could actually uh, call me uh, a professor and the director of, in of institute. Of course, I wasn't interested to be again professor, but the invitation went together with the offer to create an institute. And uh, I was 54. I was 54, and then I was in Carolina, Carolina, uh, with a young wife, with, uh, with a uh, young child, and uh, and uh, I was reading for pleasure Gertrude Stein in uh, in the local taking. I was the first reader who took the books of Gertrude Stein from a, from a people's library in Georgetown, South Carolina. I, I would check now, I suppose that I am still the only one reader. <laughs> might be there where you put them. Of the books. But it also changed my life to, to read Gertrude Stein. Uh, in, in the late 70s and uh, in early 80s. And uh, only many years afterwards, I was told, uh, I would never th think about that, that uh, uh, there is a colleague, uh, a scholar in uh, Copenhagen, uh, uh, named uh, uh, Anna Louise Schultz, and uh, he claims that 
uh, my very esoteric publications in Germany on Goethe Stein. They were the first which actually opened the reception of Goethe Stein uh, in Germany. And uh, she published uh, in this country a book last year about that. Uh, and uh, so I was very pleased that this actually, uh, this work, which was uh, very much connected with uh, this uh, genius Lotzi uh, being, being in the South, and reading also the novels of of Stein, which are dealing with the uh, with the east, with the south, and this is also be behind uh, my interest to come. so long as I can uh, to see after many years it's already I haven't been since uh, early 80s in South Carolina where uh, I also built a house yeah, there, there, will be, uh, there will be really a, a trip in yes in I told you this one of my secret things if I would have second life, I would like to be an architect. Yes. That, well, this is that, that is good. And you tell it, what is for your very first memory of theater? What is the first thing you remember ever seeing in your theater? Oh. <laughs> well, as, as actually, I'm totally unqualified to say anything valid about theater in the view of my biography, because I was born in this operetta state, uh, Poland, between two wars, which existed only 20 years, and then from 79, the terrible terror and uh, in Warsaw, and, uh, of course, no possibility to see theater. Paradoxically, I profited that I see it only now uh, uh, looking back that Poles were reduced by, by Germans to be slaves and uh, all education was forbidden, but it had a perverse advantage because uh, in a conspiration in the underground, uh, and I was a teenager at that time, I was in gymnasium, but I had university professors who taught me because universities were closed. So, it was a paradox of a terrorized city and with a dangerous, clandestine education uh, because of a danger of, of gatherings, only three students could meet with a professor, but basically I think that uh, later on I could become professor and teach and, and, and learn languages and learn Latin uh, and already as a teenager uh, later on during the Stalinist period I translated Lucretius de la Luna Natura and this still lives with me. Yes, as, uh, uh, I also dream of them in, in, in in Latin, yeah. <laughs> also, eine adum genetrix ominum volup, and so weiter. Yeah, well, well, uh, so, yeah. not, not coquette. 
as you, as you said, you knew the young pope and his girlfriend at the time, right? When he wasn't a pope well, yet from but Poland. But it was a, 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 a place, theater place. <laughs> you know, uh, Oxford, uh, similar tutoring in a terrorized city. So one of these things which, and about theater, you back to your question about, uh, so film was forbidden, and, uh, and uh, theater, of course, was also forbidden. Uh, so uh, basically, this is my thought that I am totally unqualified to talk about theater. And, that this enormous arrogance to to try to uh, to build the own biography on theater. You know the saying that that somebody who hadn't seen Hamlet at seventeen shouldn't actually talk about theater. I haven't seen Hamlet at seventeen. I couldn't. So I'm totally unqualified um, to, to, to talk about theater. How did you meet Brecht? How did, or you didn't meet, how come that you didn't meet Brecht? What was the connection? How did that start? Well, it is also a prehistory almost. So this is not enough now, uh, although I wrote about that. And actually, the first publications I, after not con uh, actually my landing in the States in 66 was an accident. And uh, I, did, I come here for the first time invited by the literary group 47 to Princeton. And uh, my intention indeed was not uh, to, to stay. And uh, anyway, I was married, I had a child, uh, and I had also a position as uh, editor in Poland. Uh, but uh, as I came to America, um, I had, of course, contact with American scholars because of my interest in German expressionism. I made friends only by correspondence with Walter Zoccelli in Stanford and uh, met with Rubicon because of Beckett. And so I had scholarly contacts uh, in the United States which then were very helpful as I was stranded suddenly. And I think you wrote about Brecht, your um, dissertation. Yes, but... but you, you, I know that you, uh, you applied to be at the Berlin Ensemble, um, to be as the assistant. Yes, uh, what is not known, uh, that Brecht, of course, uh, is a banal thing to say, but this really had said, it's only seven years Brecht's activity in East Berlin, in Berlin Ensemble. And this is explainable only through the fact that he came from emigration with the whole drawers full of plays which were not staged. And the whole Brecht canon was actually in seven years, it's actually a phenomenon of intensity. In seven years in Berlin Ensemble, the plays which were then. And in this context to your question is that Brecht was also subject matter to political restriction of the regime. Uh, although he was very careful not to criticize and 
Rotelotov Panagiric Sebat GDR out of out of gratitude that he has he got this theatre. Um, but what is not known uh, that uh, in the 50s um, he was under political restrictions in the GDR and the only country in which Berlin and Alsace visited, was permitted to visit, was Poland, People's Republic of Poland. And it was in 52 and 54, so please do, do note how early it happened, 52 and 54, yes, Brack wasn't yet, uh, uh, he was totally forgotten, his, his great name uh, from the pre-war time. And uh, all major plays, Mother Courage, Professor Brochen and Cook, uh, Caucasus or Kaide Christ, uh, were uh, stage, uh, were shown in Poland. Brett was twice in Poland, and uh, on the second on the second visit, he gave me also. Uh, this is in a reception of Brett. Uh, without precedence, he gave me rights to translate his play Schweik in Zweit and Weltkrieg. Schweik, uh, based on Hasek, of course, uh, uh, noun, novel. Uh, politically very naive play, showing that the fact that he was an emigre, uh, he had this whole insights, uh, he had no idea about uh, about the cruelty. No, no, that's not well formulated. I would say he had no idea about the possibility of resistance, the possibility of resistance uh, in World War I uh, paradigm of Hasek, yes, uh, was not applicable to, uh, to the situation in the Second World War. However, politically, uh, no, poetically, it's a great play. And there, I was ever uh, translator of poetry, also of German poetry, translated a lot of German. And the, one of the, to my mind, the most beautiful theatrical uh, uh, poetry of Brecht is in Schweigen, Zweiten, Weltkrieg. Uh, yeah, I know that, uh, I think you once also, Christina is here, you gave the talk at Yale where you said Poland all of a sudden became for 10 years a talk a world power, and uh, was that also was Brecht's uh, impulse? Was that a changing the scene, or do you think it was a homegrown uh, a theme that came out the, the 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 intensity that came from Poland as contribution to world theater? Was that already there, or was that also no, what, initiated uh, uh, by Brecht? You, said, you mean the impact of Brecht on yeah. Polish theater? Yeah. No, the, just just in reverse because it was still. Uh, domination of uh, so-called uh, uh, leftist critics uh, uh, Brecht was from the official state criticism in Poland received very critically as a pacifist and so which was actually the Soviet time, of course, 
of criticism of pacifist, uh, uh, post-expressionist, and so on. Uh, so it was not easy to to to, to fight for Brecht, and that that show, shows my story. I wrote very early. Uh, this dissertation about something which I want to, to be a dissertation. There's no chances to be put officially on the uh, universities which we can have, uh, uh, which became uh, um, uh, a publication or. or no, which became vulgar Marxism, yes. Yeah. Uh, so I wrote very early this, actually, the, uh, the stereometric structure uh, was written to, uh, with intent, intention to be a doctoral dissertation, but, but then it was no chance to publish it in Poland, the reason for that. Uh, I started, uh, my university studies after the war, and they were two first years of the university in Poland after the war, which were um, still like a pre-war university. That is to say, the, the, the Polish strong position in the logistic and uh, um, uh, the links with Wittgenstein and Schlick and Carnap uh, um, of of my professors, yes, and uh, uh, this was my education, yes, from by Kotarbinski to Kotarkiewicz and, uh, and people who who were connected to uh, to, to Wittgenstein. Uh, logistic. This was interested me. It was very bad. Common. Uh, this was uh, possible to study first two years after the war, but after that it was no more kosher. Uh, so, uh, so I wrote my dis uh, my would be dissertation into drawer and only by by chance it was published in germany after Brecht's death in a very widely read magazine zinn home as this uh, structure and, and it, it it was the best thing to happen to me because the piece was noticed, of course, because of Brecht. And, uh, but I was criticized in the East uh, and uh, pra praised in the West. How come that, that suddenly from this restricted Poland comes such a voice? Uh, so, I was lucky, but it was... Uh, and, and then I couldn't publish it in Poland until 66. And then in 66, uh, it was published in, in Breslau, in Wrocław. We heard uh, today in the documentary Hans T. Sleiman, who, and we will talk a bit later about post traumatic theater, said, you know, they are also your great contribution to theater was the idea of the the Lehrstück or the theater without audience, and um, and I know you also directed Fatzer in Kappel in, in a couple of universities. So is that uh, you always said it, this is perhaps the the, uh, the center of Brecht's work that had been overlooked. So maybe, I don't know how very well known it is not. Maybe share, but do you still feel that uh, uh, the, the 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 theater ohne Publikum, the theater without audience? Uh, perhaps was Brecht's uh, greatest contribution on the formal level? Well, that is well taken point. Yes, I think uh, 
I got it from Brecht. Of course, it was already forgotten, but uh, uh, I didn't make an ideological point of it. I, I had said that uh, uh, it opens a new vistas if you think about theater without an audience, yes? And, uh, but I mean that to Brecht, of course, in that. Tell us a bit about your Fatzer experiments and the idea behind it that we saw also in the, in the, in the workshops. Uh, with Fatzer, it was a funny story. Thank you for asking, <laughs> because Fatzer is like the uh, kind of an unfinished work by Brecht. It's a, a collection of material he worked on for over decades of soldiers lost in World War One and and uh, because and, yeah. what, yes. what happened after Brecht's death, early death, yes, and it was fifty six, as he died, and the very early, yes, he died, and Helen Weigel became a director, and. Uh, also his uh, his daughter and uh, her husband Eckhard Shang uh, had a voice over the rehive and of course material interest as uh, successors also to uh, to a big income from the productions of Brecht around the world. And obviously, this is not only with Brecht, but usually the inheritors uh, are very busy to, to tell the outside world that there is still something hidden, that not everything is out. And And we knew, we, the, the, is the Brecht's portion, about Fatzer. Fatzer was a play which he started as a, as a Schaustück, as, uh, as a, a drama, actually, yes. And uh, in the 20s, and uh, and not finished it as a drama, and those were the years where he got ideas about Lerschlück and started to new version, which also is not finished, of a Fatzer as a, Fatzer is the name of a, uh, of, of, of a soldier who deserted from the World War One together with three other colleagues, and uh, who went into uh, in the conspiracy in the underground, expecting the Red Revolution to happen. And anyway, enormous volume of material not finished, not finished as a Schaustück, not finished as a Lerch. And it was seated in Berlin, uh, some Brecht Erheil. And all requests of my German colleagues uh, to see it were refused by Helene Weigel and uh, a daughter of Brecht. Uh, and I knew a Brecht, Brecht strategy as a writer. He was extremely slow. Uh, slow. Clever? Yeah, clever in these terms. Extremely clever. Uh, a s a situation he, w he went to, he knew that he would be manipulated by the uh, East regime for the gift of having a theater, but 
he didn't want to be uh, slave to this manipulation. And he did a very clever thing. He gave the rights to his place also to Zurkam Verlag, editing house in West Germany. So the, the first rights were to Aubau Verlag in East Germany and the, the Western. So they, they so to say, uh, this was a regulative thing. It was impossible to, to, uh, to go away from canon, yes. So if there was East German edition of Brecht parallel by Auerbach Verlag and uh, the uh, Western edition by Zurkamp. Now, anyway, this facet, uh, there a lot of my German colleagues uh, tried to get it. And I also tried to get it, uh, and of course didn't get uh, permission. And then, as I came to the States, I remember Brecht's tactics. That I knew that I don't know why my German colleagues didn't use it because they could use this door which was still open that Brecht sent to Houghton Library in Harvard uh, film rolls with his whole oeuvre. So the same old fox strategy to have it. But for some reason nobody in Germany uh, took advantage of it. And I just came to, as I came to America, I, I went to Stefan Breg, the son, and uh, asked him for a permission uh, to read uh, the films uh, in Houghton Library in Harvard. It, it, they were real film roles. Uh, and I read it on the uh, uh, so old-fashioned machine. You uh, saw page after page and copied it and uh, translated it. Of course, uh, I was not enough skillful to, uh, to, to trust my ability to, to translate from German into English. So I did together with Leslie Wilson uh, professor of German in Texas, Austin. And so the... That's a wonderful. So then you made also the jump from Brecht and of course after, you know, all your Polish uh, uh, theater makers to, to the American avant-garde, especially to Robert Wilson. You're most well known also in Germany for your big defense of Robert Wilson's D, D and D1, Death, Destruction and Detroit at the Schaubühne, which was hated by most German theater critics, even though the Actors loved it, the audience loved it, but he really uh, encountered great resistance. And Andre uh, wrote in Theater heute an article saying, you know, the connections of uh, to Hess, to Spandau, explained the work, and um, also that inspired, and also Hannah Müller, who uh, included, um, then, uh, then went to, uh, to see and opened up his, um, um, his reception that came to that friendship between Wilson and, and Hannah Müller that created this uh, unique work. Um, to talk about Wilson, you just went last week to see E.T., The Hoffman's Tale. So tell us a bit, uh, if nobody here in the room has seen it. So we talked about your earliest memory. So your last one is seeing a Wilson production. So tell us a little bit what you, what you saw there and how, 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 <laughs> you have, how you have observed him over the decades. Well, uh, actually to... Uh, to assume that Bob uh, read at I Hoffman, uh, this would be uh, a crazy idea. He's not, he's just not inspired himself from 
uh, readings, but particularly of such an esoteric author uh, uh, of the Shang Romanticism, uh, Etare Hoffman. Um, but uh, theater in Düsseldorf uh, approached him with a project and uh, I am forgetting now the name, I gave you the program. Uh, there is a, and I also haven't seen it, I uh, haven't heard it. Uh, there is a young uh, British girl who came with two albums of, uh, as a singer and a guitarist. Calvi, I think, is. Uh, you have seen it. I, I gave you this problem. Yes. Mm. And uh, this inspired him, uh, actually. And uh, I went to, uh, I think it will be a very big hit. It is not sold for global circulation as all pieces of Wilson produced in Berlin Ensemble under direction of Weimann because Weimann is no more uh, uh, the director of uh, actually this is the last season uh, of the Berlin Ensemble but I'm, uh, I'm sure it will be a global success and I'm not informed what kind of deals were made. Um, because this is a radical musical. This is in the, uh, in the vicinity of Black Rider, actually. And uh, I talked to Wilson in Rani Schwarzhausen uh, last week where the premiere, the premiere took place. And uh, I was very skeptical that he will do something based on, 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 on Etai Hoffman. Hoffman's tales, you know, you know the opera. The yeah, opera. A shower romantic, yeah. Uh, and then I changed my, my mind. I, I didn't know anything about this. Uh, uh, young artist from England and uh, the idea is uh, I talked to Bob afterwards he said and he said that what influenced him in this piece is Steve Heiner Müller Hamlet Maschine, Mensch Maschine yes, uh, which actually is not Miller's idea, because uh, as you know, expressionists had also this idea. German expressionist, Mensch, Maschine, uh, and um, in, in what terms uh, the, the, the figures are totally artificial, because th 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 this is uh, Düsseldorf young dance ensemble, also dancers, and the voice is given by singers. So they are artificial figures. It's not novel, of course, uh, uh, but uh, the whole aesthetic is based on that. And, uh, I, I think it's an enormous hit because one thing that I told Bob, uh, because he asked you, what do you think? What do you think? Yes. I said, well, <laughs> it must be a success. And the reason for that is that it does not required a sustained attention. It's boom, boom, boom. Yeah? This is the whole aesthetic is 
for uh, for short attention span. We are box, 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 box. Of course, I am not from this generation, but I understand. Well, I try to understand the, the mechanism. It must be the success because for two hours you are bang, 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 bang. And so, um, uh, yeah, Andrew, you brought a lot of the avant garde to, to Gieson. It was, you know, Richard Schachner, uh, uh, Bob Wilson, Molly Davis, John Jasson came, um, and many, many others. And this idea, you used first the term in 1984 already of uh, the post dramatic theater was your, your uh, invention and then put it to a comprehensive system by Hans Lehmann. But uh, you, you still continue to watch and say even this term does no longer grab what theater is about now. So w what are your reflections on, 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 on global theater and this kind of you know, turbo capitalism, as we say, in the com contemporary global world we live in? Where is, what is the place of theater? What is, it, what is it saying and what should it be saying from your point of view? No, I think what I'm saying in Germany also that the ensemble this Auslaufen, this model, meaning that ensemble, ensemble theater is a model which is Auslaufen. Uh, which is out, out, no longer in fashion, it's just, you know, out, yes. outgoing model. Out, outgoing model, yes. Ensemble is globally, actually. Just remember that Mnuchkin and uh, Brook uh, and Strehler, uh, just name them, yes? They are all historical names. We, we don't have now. It's a time to reflect why. Uh, we don't have more the theater be, became more uh, like a kino. Kino means movies. Theater became uh, more like movies. movies. Yes, and uh, a big example is, uh, is the Schaubühne, as a for the former ensemble theater of Peter Stein, uh, which uh, you mentioned the, the, the scandal with with Wilson, the DD and D, uh, which I, uh, it's very interesting that actually uh, Stein, uh, 79, uh, still director of the, probably the biggest, the, the most important European theatres, uh, ensemble theatres uh, of the Schaubühne invited Robert Wilson. And Robert Wilson staged the destruction of Detroit, the classic, 79. And this became the end of the Schaubühne because uh, Stein Stein got a suspicion that Stein, the leftist, and selbstgenannt uh, communist, yes, uh, thought that this is some uh, fabulous eye. Rotten egg, yeah. Yes, uh, which Wilson uh, put in his left this theater and it was a big scandal uh, especially after the after Stein's actors after working with Wilson started to revolt against the director Stein, and uh, it was a famous exchange between. Uh, I obtained uh, for my students 
the internal protocols from the rehearsals uh, with Stein and the big tragic actress Edith Clever. Uh, in exchange, during uh, internal exchange with Stein, uh, complained, he said, to you, Peter Stein, you never told me that what this Yankee told me. And I said, well, what he told you? He came to me and said, Edith, you are a star. Uh, so this, uh, <laughs> you, you may laugh, that's what the actors want to hear. Yes, as uh, Peter Stein had this military, authoritarian style, yes, and actually very brutal also with actors. It was the end of Peter Stein and now under the director from the former East Berlin, Ostermeyer, uh, Schaubühne became a kind of a kino. Uh, a movie theater. A movie theater, yes. With everything. There is a young, for the first time in German theater, there is a young audience. There is a young audience and the habitus of going to theater is as it is among young people who are going to, 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 to movies because it's dark there, yes? Uh, <laughs> and uh, indeed, it's just uh, also the, the, the tempo and uh, and uh, big presence because uh, the, 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 the educational theater in Germany had no young people in, in the classical period. And now you have for the first time young people in theater. Just uh, I know more about that as I would like to know. The reason being that as my mobility became limited, the, the Schaubühne happened to be around my house. So I, I, I got to go through the street to, to, uh, see to the Schaubühne. So um, be before we open up to perhaps a couple of questions, um, you, you said that perhaps that idea of post-traumatic theater no longer really grabs the current theater, contemporary theater, or as Brecht said, you know, we need new, in new times, we need new forms of theater. What would you describe then? What, 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 uh, what uh, the zeitgeist, what is the era we live in? Is there some, is a, a term one could grab that? I always remember you said theater is a model for something. That's why it's so interesting that something happens on the stage that perhaps then also could happen in a reality, in a society, at a home, or into, but what, what is, what, what, what are you saying? Is there um, a, a, a term or is there a, a description, an atmosphere one could use to describe what theater at the moment is about or should be about? It's very eclectic. It's very sensation oriented. Uh, It's very much like a journalist discourse about about uh, uh, disinformation and so on. Uh, uh, something which usually is is very publicistic. Mm. How to say? Publishing. Yeah. It, Publish, yes, uh, something, uh, yeah, li li like a p political part of, of a magazine. And uh, very often uh, that stück, that has a play 
is no more a model. This could be, uh, this could be uh, open reading. Uh, yeah. Uh, it could be everything, but not, not necessarily uh, for children of the drama. <coughs> Jelinek is uh, a Beispiel, uh, mm -hmm. example on that. Jelinek's, yeah, for the Jelinek's work. Yeah, so maybe uh, Brad and Michael, we put a little bit light up in the audience. We do also have a microphone if you, you know, have maybe a question or a comment. And uh, again, thank you for, um, for joining us after spending a day in an airplane and having an overnight flight and having just arrived for a couple of hours. That is you know, most, most kind and generous of you not to. Not, not to bail on us. So are there any, any um, um, comments or questions or, um, or remarks? Also maybe about the film in case you saw it this afternoon. Thank you, Andre, for being here. Wonderful. Uh, I would like to uh, maybe relate to that question about young people in the theater because and uh, what you said about theater as politically minded, like publicistica, like, uh, like a discussion engaging people. Because when I saw Ostermeyer's here, um, The Enemy of the People, <laughs> then I was surprised to what extent uh, the whole audience, I don't know, uh, you must have seen that production, whole audience was engaged. I had never ever seen uh, everybody asking questions. So in, in your term, do you consider this, that this is theater without the audience when the audience becomes a part of the whole uh, theater production? That's, that's one, uh, one thing. And in the, same, in the same manner in Poland, when I saw, let's say, uh, Dorota Maswalska's uh, No Matter How Hard We Try, the interaction between very many young people that, w that surprised me, interaction between the audience and, and uh, whatever was happening on stage was again so emotional that it just, uh, again, I was thinking about theater without the audience when the audience becomes a part of the whole production. Thank you. So what do you think about it? Uh, this is a question. Uh, I can say only anecdote because uh, it sounds unbelievable, but, but, but as illustration to my thesis about it, uh, that theater becomes as a, uh, as, uh, as a movie, um, as atmosphere. Mm. Uh, I'm still. Seeing almost everything in Schaubühne because I'm getting also free tickets, and I'm sitting still, although I, I'm not making any uh, theater criticism um, in journalistic terms. Uh, and uh, in the seventh row, and uh, it's dark, and uh, I was in one play, and suddenly I feel uh, a pressure on my uh, uh, right arm, and so I'm looking a little behind, and I, I think that there is a uh, there is a young lady who put uh, uh, her leg on my arm. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, of course, it's not unpleasant, yes. <laughs> and uh, what I would hate to, 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 to appear as an older gentleman who, uh, who protests. <laughs> so I, I only make a small movement of her head and she saw obviously only a black figure 
and after uh, some seconds, I feel the pressure on the another arm. <laughs> <laughs> so well, uh, and my colleagues don't want to believe about that. They say this is Andre's fantasy. <laughs> no, this is not a fantasy. And happened. Uh, another thing. This is a new. I'm for sure not proved, but uh, s some things still uh, seeing from the premiere, uh, still being in generation who remembers the, uh, the, the ritual of the premiere and sitting in the seventh row and behind me, uh, they are young people in jeans uh, and we know that uh, uh, the the back side of jeans is uh, is now is not an erotic place yes you can show like in a zoo yes so uh, i see three persons leaning upon and I cannot stop as an agent provocateur, whom I am, as you know. So I said, you say, too much information. <laughs> and <laughs> so they look, <laughs> don't understand what I'm saying, too much information. Uh, but this is, the, this is the atmosphere. And And it's exactly what I have around the corner now. Uh, well, uh, the show yeah, there are there changing, changing, uh, changing audiences? It's all complication. I think you, uh, do you have a question? Um, yeah, we were watched the documentary just now, and I was really, really moved by something I heard. It says like, um, like we came for the ocean but we got shallow waters instead. It happens a lot of times in many cases, and I hope it was not what you feel like to say about what the theater has done over the decades. So as a also a re theater researcher, I wonder what would you like to say, or where, what would you see the promises of doing theater itself and doing theater research? Thank you. Well, I don't know. The she, uh, she said that, um, you know, that we, we were promised ocean, but deep depth in the water, and you're it's very shallow. Do you think theater also, you know, is becoming shallow and shallow? Oh. Is it worth the research? Or should what should one research? Well, it depends where you think where theater happened happens. If theater happens on the stage, or if the theater happens uh, in the audience, uh, or maybe theater happens in a discourse, in a written critical discourse which it provokes or not provokes. Uh, so, um, uh, it's an interesting question you, you are posing, but uh, um, I, I would say it happens it happens differently, yes. Um, you did say, Anjay, that, um, and I agree with you that, if I understand you correctly, that um, a, a lot of the work that we see is very journalistic a lot of the contemporary theater is very journalistic in a sense. 
because it's on the level of like magazine writing or, or and we have very good investigative reporting, very good journalism and magazine writing. I'm, I'm, I, I, I love journalism, but it, it's not as artistic, uh, but perhaps, um, because we're used to uh, getting our, you know, a lot of uh, contemporary stories and everything now from radio and from, uh, and from <coughs> magazines and, <coughs> and even online journalism. So I've, I've wondered, myself for many years, like w what will theater do with itself, you know? And I've recently um, been thinking that I, I, I'd like to see the return to the writer because I, I feel <coughs> that, um, you know, these times need a much more philosophic, uh, poetic, um, rigorously intellectual way of, of uh, understanding the contemporary world. Um, beyond this journalistic way. And I've recently felt that by, I, I, I really, I've recently felt that one, <coughs> one area to, to, that I found this has been in the w recent work of Carol Churchill, who I feel is creating a new dramatic language and creating new forms. And I find her work extraordinary and one of the really few people in the, in the, in the theater uh, who it has really created new forms and new languages for our time. A, a, a totally different kind of um, a language, a dystopian language in the way that uh, the uh, Russians and the German expressionists and, uh, and uh, the Kavich, even the Poles, um, created language in the period between the wars. But it is a kind of catastrophic imagination. And a lot of people don't want to go in that place. But I, I, I'm saying that I have found this newer vision, at least in, in writing, in Carol Churchill's recent work, which is very uh, difficult, but very brilliant, her, her last few plays. So it's, it's one alternative to a lot of the spectacle and media and um, journalistic work that is not reaching that level, I feel. Yeah, I'm so I said, I am so moved to <laughs> the sending from Bonnie, and uh, I have to tell you the anecdote. And uh, you have to say that if it is true or not. I, I remember uh, uh, as the crisis started of the City University in seventy six, seventy seven, and we lost a lot of graduate students due to financial difficulties and uh, Bonnie and Gautam Vazgupta were students of mine at that time and they came to me and asked what to do and you remember I told you you should make a, a serious profound theater magazine Yes, you asked what to do, what you did, of course. And it was, uh, I had said, it will, be, it will be something novel in the context of the theater pub publication in the 70s, yes. And indeed, perform, uh, a PAJ played this role, yes. It was totally new. To, to have a, a journal of this ambition and the, the, this quality, which, which opens, now I'm persecuted by, the, uh, by people who are saying that they're my oldest students. And who is my oldest student? And still somebody else comes. <laughs> and now the, uh, skip. Uh, th uh, there is a Brecht scholar, very well known, and also in a certain way later on uh, biography may be not totally uh, different as mine, uh, Klaus Völker, uh, who, is, who was also the founder of the uh, Ernst Busch Schule, uh, a prominent uh, uh, School of Acting uh, in Berlin, and um, he claims to be my oldest student. Yes. I'm sure, somewhere is someone else. 
So maybe we, we will have a little reception here so you can ask additional questions, but is there one more, maybe a comment or... Um, um, oh, Peter, yes, please. Um, I was just interested in this photograph or two photographs where you're, uh, you're with the no mask. Um, did you have a relationship to Japanese theatre at all in your career? And yeah. I don't know whether you've Not seen asking it. asking about the, the mask, you know, yeah. I think there's Daniel's. Oh, oh yes, uh, okay. What is the uh, history of the photo? Oh yes, <laughs> it's interesting that you're asking. Uh, but, but because it is also necessary to say here, uh, <coughs> is for me personally very moving. Uh, th th this was uh, done uh, l last photo montage uh, done in Germany, in Berlin, uh, on the occasion of uh, uh, some... Uh, Golden Festspiele. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A day with Angel Bird, yeah. No, th this was, you know, this... Uh, uh, one day with Andrzej Wood, yeah. yeah. Uh, we have in Germany now uh, under a new direction of the uh, uh, Theater Festspiele we have uh, now something which called One Day With and they arranged for me so one day with ATW and uh, there are these two pictures the, the one is uh, is Jadwiga here? No. No. Uh, one is with the original no mask from 66, and this is the mask which is still in the apartment of Jadwiga Gerald here on the uh, 66th Street in New York. Um, which uh, uh, a friend of mine uh, and a former colleague here in graduate school, Daniel Gerald, uh, a great translator of Witkiewicz, uh, brought from Korea, I think, uh, about uh, the mask is Japanese, original law. Uh, so as it happened that uh, as I thought instead as I landed as I say without planning it uh, in America and uh, my first position was in, in Stanford and uh, then uh, I rented <laughs> uh, an, an apartment from Daniel Gerald who was um, professor of the San Francisco <coughs> State College uh, and uh, in his apartment I, I discovered this no mask and it shows me from 66 with, uh, with the mask of, of no and uh, the later picture is uh, I don't own, unfortunately, the, uh, the original no mask, but uh, uh, a Japanese friend gave me a, a replica, which is actually a replica of no. This is this is not uh, original mask. Really expensive, very difficult to get. And uh, uh, at Berlin and Festspiele had this idea uh, to make a composition out of it. It is um, on my two days face, which you can see. And uh, uh, this is a very good no mask, but no, not original. Uh, and the the, the, the no mask from 66 is uh, original no mask. May I put it 
amongst people. We have the all yeah, all have have yeah, you saw it, yeah. Yeah, so it, it certainly as an image does uh, 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 signify uh, uh, decades and uh, time and memory and uh, and, uh, and ghosting and, uh, and, uh, and uh, a transition of time. So I think you, um, we looked a little bit behind the mask uh, of Andrzej Wirt uh, tonight, and I normally it could go on for much longer and a bit more, but um, uh, in respect also to, to your long uh, journey, long day's journey home. Um, <laughs> and I, I also heard you had a little whiskey in your hotel, is that true? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so uh, we we, uh, we 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 come to an end. I hope you can stay around a little bit and say hello to um, our friends and you, some of your friends who came here. We really would like to uh, say thank you and pay our respect for an extraordinary life in the landscape of theater and the landscape of world theater, and the great uh, contributions um, you have made. And uh, it's really a model. Even you might say there are no models on stage, but still here is a model um, on our stage um, for. Um, what uh, life in theater can do, da, can do, and and can inspire. So thank you for coming, and really uh, a big. Can I say something? Next? <laughs> <laughs> I think I should say something about Frank, uh, who is my student from the. Uh, I used to speak to us, say that relationship between me and the former student. Frank uh, is uh, Socratic I guess. Uh, in, in these terms that I learned a lot from him, from Frank. I learned uh, in order not to make an empty compliment. He brought, he forced me to learn computer. <laughs> And I am the only one in my g generation, yes. <laughs> and, uh, I don't nominate Sunt Odioza. I would not say your name, but a very famous colleague of mine, younger as I am, who has a very significant institute for the performing arts, uh, and big institute, and uh, she organizes international co conference of performers to which young people are coming with their computers, with laptops, on which they play like Rubinstein, yeah? <laughs> yeah. But the, the, the great professoressa writes with Kugelschreiber. <laughs> she writes with pencil. <laughs> Uh, she is younger as I am, and I have to think about. <laughs> um, yeah. So part of the uh, biography that hopefully will also come out uh, in, in English soon. We have we are trying to help uh, with the translation. I think Richard Groff uh, from Performance Research will also publish it in, in London, so it will be uh, available in English. Uh, clean forward or forward, and not forgetting, like Brecht would say in his songs. I think it's a motto. If anybody reads German and wants to have this, we have a couple of books here. And otherwise, we'll have to wait a little bit. But again, uh, but I think a big applause. Under that, a big applause. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.